Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, to those that, of you that are new, I'm Tracy Anderson, RISE Association Marketing Coordinator. Um, we are delighted to have you join us for today's webinar titled, Where's the Meat? Insights into how recent coding clinics affect risk adjustment, presented by our sponsor, Centauri Health Solutions. Today's webinar features Ronnie Knight, who I'm going to introduce here in a second. Um, first, I do have a few housekeeping items to go over with you all. Um, as you might have noticed, when you joined, all attendee lines are on mute, um, and you will remain on mute throughout the entirety of the event. Um, of course, all of your feature buttons are located at the bottom of your screen. Um, to send our presenter um, questions at any point in time, just type your question into the Q&A box and hit send. Um, we will be answering questions at the end of the webinar, but feel free to send those questions at any point in time throughout the webinar. Today's program is being recorded. Um, we will be posting a copy of this recording in our, our member library um, that exists in the member portal. We'll also be sending you a copy of the presentation deck, as well as a, a, a recording, a copy of the recording from today's webinar. Um, you can expect that a few days after the webinar is complete um, via email. We do ask that you stay tuned in for the entirety of the presentation. Um, this way you can participate in our, our member experience survey. Um, it's just a quick poll that's gonna pop up and remain available just so you can give us your feedback about today's experience. And now for the introduction of our speaker. Today we are joined by Ronnie Knight, an experienced healthcare veteran of 30 years, most of which has been in the coding and CDI sector. The past 13 years, she has focused on coding and project management, as well as one-on-one -on -one -on -one provider education. As Centauri's Director of Coding, Ronnie oversees all coding-related projects, works in tandem with client services, and has worked directly with the ID, IT department to develop and enhance the advanced software of NLP platform. As part of her role, she is responsible for ensuring the coding team remains up to date on current coding guidelines and develops Centauri's internal guidelines and processes. Without further ado, I will let Ronnie take it from here. Thank you, Tracy. Welcome, everyone, and thank you to our sponsor, the Rise Association, for today's webinar. And thank you, everyone, for joining us here. Let me share my screen. All right, so we will get started. Thank you for the introduction, Tracy. Get that screen there. So today we're talking about meat, right? How did it evolve? Going back to the inception of risk adjustment, where it's been for the past 15 years, and where is it going now? So we want to talk about the history of the risk adjustment first. Um, many of you are probably you know, working in the industry, so this is relevant to you. Or maybe there might be a few folks here who want to learn more. So we'll give a brief history. We'll talk about me. We'll talk about what the coding guidelines say. We'll talk about the CMS and the DOJ and what they have to say. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, outpatient CDI programs and some of those opportunities there. We'll talk about some of those gray areas um, where there's gaps as well. So I hope that we'll have a very rising discussion today. So what is risk adjustment? Well, it's a methodology of predictive modeling to assess and calculate expenditures over a fixed time. And in general, it uses the diagnosis and demographics of the patient, but that can be a little bit dependent on which model we're talking about. Uh, today, we're going to be referencing mostly the MA model for Medicare risk adjustment, which is the senior population for the most part, since that's where it all started. You know, the structure for the ACA is a little bit different, and how they get paid is a little bit different. Um, if you work with, you know, the Medicare model, CMS pays a per member per month based on that information, the RAF score of the patient and the demographics and diagnosis. Whereas the ACA is funded a little differently and paid out differently by HHS, who transfers funds from lower risk plans to those with higher risk. So some are paying into the pool and others are being paid from the pool, dependent on how sick their population is. And part of the reason for that is to 
adjust and make sure that there's no incentive to only have healthy patients in the populations. So when did it all start? Well, some of you may or may not know that risk adjustment actually was first introduced back in 1997 with the Balanced Budget Act. And that was where they first implemented risk adjustment in an inpatient setting. And it was for diagnosis collection to determine payouts, excuse me, to MAO organizations. The Benefits Improvement and Protection Act of 2000, which is known as BIPA, mandated the ambulatory settings where we got our outpatient. So they wanted that data to be collected as well. And they started an incremental phase in and got to the 100% payment rate in 2007. In 2006, the Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement and Modernization Act, or MMA, was where they introduced the Part D methodology, which is the RxHCCs in the Medicare uh, versus congestional world. So just a few facts there that some may not be aware of. It goes back a lot farther than when we actually started um, reviewing records for risk adjustment. The data was being collected quite a bit before we actually started these retro reviews. It has been adjusted over time. Uh, there's been several different models. It's had a few overhauls, additions and, and removals of various HCCs. And there were a couple of years where we had blended models for payment, uh, where they used a portion or a percentage of a previous model and the newer model until the newer model was fully phased in. So this, over time has changed some. The data that's collected you know, comes from covered facilities or what we refer to as acceptable sources and outpatient services that were provided to the plan's covered populations. So for an MAO, this data translates to that RAF score. That's the score for the individual that determines the per member per month payment. So you can see that failure to capture all the members' HCCs, you know, even just one HCC can really result in thousands of dollars in reduced payments on a monthly basis, excuse me, basis for any uncaptured HCCs during that calendar year. So gap closure and good CDI program is really important. If you use vendors for your program uh, for HCC capture, you really need to work with them on a continuous basis. Make sure everybody's on the same page, where you are, where you're going and having good interpretation and analysis of the data that you get back. Hopefully you're able to close those care gaps. It's not just important for the payment, but it's important for your members' care as well. You work on the health plan side. So let's talk about the an acronym, or acronym, excuse me, MEET. Where did it come from? What does it mean? Well, it means to monitor, evaluate or examine, address, assess, or treat. Now here's what we really want to get to the heart of today, right? Um, I've been with working with risk adjustment since its inception. And I honestly couldn't tell you exactly where this started, but I believe the roots go back to the first RAD B around 2008 where we finally had some documentation specifics from CMS about how they were applying rules. And within that first couple of years there, that really kind of just took fire and evolved into MEET. It wasn't something that CMS Burbage actually used. It's not documented anywhere specifically in the guidelines or in anyone's book. So it's just an industry term. So there are some that might say meat doesn't exist. CMS themselves says they don't recognize this term. So possibly the way that you've been trained or told about meat didn't really come from CMS because it's just an industry term that kind of became gospel. It's not entirely true that it doesn't exist. 
It's just that they use a different term when we talk about it. I think this is where the rub is that everyone has uh, taken different interpretations of what this means. If you kind of look at the road map here, it's a bumpy road, it's got lots of curves in the road. 1997, the inception, 2007 being the first year of 100% payments implemented. Then you had your first Grad B and the documentation from CMS um, on how they were applying rules and capturing for HCCs, which kind of lent credence to the meet. Health plans also started developing their own guidance and interpretations based on this. And this is where there's been a lot of differences and disparity over the years, each plan coming up with their own interpretation. And then you have the 2020, you have the new coding clinic advice and also some new advice uh, on the most recent Red V that included some more specific statements regarding um, systemic conditions. And then, of course, you have the, another coding clinic that further clarified this year in third quarter what they said in 2020. And then you also have a DOJ lawsuit very recently that was filed um, stating there's no such thing as an always coded condition. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of those things. I have said repeatedly over the years, if you don't like change, you might be in the wrong line of work because healthcare coding and risk adjustment is something that has changed and evolved over time. And there are always going to continue to be changes as the population changes. You're definitely going to see over time that things will change. So most certainly you gotta be able to roll with those punches. CMS, the, the term they use is support. To me, this is equates to the same thing as meat. We don't know necessarily even all call it that. There are other acronyms out there that are being used that mean the same thing. Now, if you go back to the 2008 Risk Adjustment Data Technical Assistance for MA Organizations Participant Guide from that first strategy, they talk about uh, a list of chronic conditions that are always reportable or always inspect, expected to impact care and all with the most minor of encounters. Those conditions became referred to as the CMS-8, ones that you, know, you might find in a problem list or in past medical history that don't resolve, they, you know, they don't go away, and they will always be considered to impact care and should be captured. Um, this is kind of where every you know, health plan has come up with different guidance. Vendors have come up with different guidance. So not everyone is always entirely on the same page, whether you're coding internally or, or you are a vendor and you're coding for health plans. You may find that if you've worked more than one project uh, with different health plans, that each has their own set of guidelines that may vary because they've interpreted something a little bit differently. The one true guidance is your book. It is the number one in the hierarchy, right? This is the official coding guidelines. And CMS repeatedly references that you should only be using acceptable sources. Among those sources is your book your, and your coding clinics, most certainly. I think this is really where it started. Now, whether you think about it in terms of support or whether you think about it in terms of me, we're really talking about the same thing. Is the documentation in the record supportive of the diagnosis listed? It's no different than if you were to look at the guidelines in your book, whether you're coding for inpatient or outpatient, you're looking at what constitutes a reportable diagnosis. 
Was it the reason for the encounter? Was it the reason that it's chiefly responsible for the service that was provided? Is it a coexisting condition? Is it being treated on an ongoing basis? Those are all things that are documented in your official coding guidelines on a yearly basis. Now, as far as from the 2008 initial guidance that came out from CMS as to how they were seeing things and interpreting it, not much really changed from, from that time all the way up through 2019. However, they did become fairly aggressive in recoupment of monies you know, through RADV and targeting for diagnosis they felt were overcoded. Uh, if they saw that a plan maybe had an overabundance in their population of a specific diagnosis that was likely to be frequently miscoded, those were the kinds of ones that they would target each year. They would choose targeted specific diagnosis, and generally the more higher dollar um, ones were ones that they would look to recoup monies on, and they would be the ones that would most often be affected uh, and coded in improperly. Health plans started you know, doing their own guidelines, coming up with their own chronic list based on their interpretation of that guidance. So there has been a lot of disparity there. You know, some of the larger health plans are, are more aggressive, while some of the smaller plans tend to be on a more conservative approach, because certainly recruitment of any monies from a smaller plan is going to have a much higher impact. And they often don't have as many resources for the types of programs that some of the larger plans have for chasing those gaps and closing them. As we've talked about, you know, me, you also have to think of some of the things that have come up since then, like social determinants of health. There are a lot more programs out there now, most certainly, than there were a decade ago. And that's a good thing for patients, most certainly. But one thing you certainly don't want is to be targeted by CMS. They refer to that targeted audit, you know, that's the full colonoscopy, as, as they say. They really um, dig in on those. And once you become a target, they can keep coming back. So most try to stay off their radar. So in 2020, you know, we had the new RADV technical assistance guide that came out for the most recent RADV, which, by the way, they're, they're several years behind. Um, so the most recent RADV, they're still looking at things from before ICD-10 even came about. So you kind of have to keep that in mind as you're looking at information that comes from CMS and when they do a RADV, they never do a RADV for anything that still has data being collected, and it's you know it's at least two years behind. Basically, is what they're doing a RADV on is anything that the window has closed on to submit for. So if the window's still open for submission, it's not something that they're going to do a RADV against at that time. So you still have time to clean up and delete any diagnosis that shouldn't be on your files, as long as that window is still open. You can self-report. CMS did state in, in 2020 that more general systemic conditions uh, would always impact care, kind of moving away from their smaller statement back in 2008 that just talked about a few specific conditions. And because that 2008 was very limited, though it did say um, the list may not be all inclusive, no one knew how to really interpret that and what that might include. So some plans stuck with just the eight that were listed, that were referred to as the CMS eight, while others took a more broader interpretation of that. And that is kind of where all these chronic lists uh, that may differ between plans or between vendors came from. Does it necessarily make them wrong? Well, 
It depends on how you're interpreting it. So the answer there is, is one of those gray areas that we talk about. But most certainly you should have a well-documented policy, whatever that policy is, and it shouldn't go against any uh, coding guidance. You don't want it to conflict with anything that we know to be true. That is your number one source. We also had in 2020, um, with the resulting, you know, from the pandemic, CMS came out with a telehealth rule under the CARES Act, uh, dating back to March 27th, 2020, where they began to allow um, audio and visual encounters to count for risk adjustment. So that was new, allowing those. But they did have to prove that it was both audio and visual for the patient in order to, to use it for Medicare risk adjustment. Now, the same rule doesn't necessarily apply when we're talking about commercial and Medicaid. They have different rules in different states there for, for Medicaid, whether they allow it or not. But under um, HHS for commercial or what's known as ACA, they do allow um, audio only. So a little bit different rules depending on what model you are working with. Uh, as far as whether it's RADV or IVA for the commercial side. So it does differ a little bit. So again, you could have separate guidance if you're working um, based on the type of patient demographic uh, that you're coding for. What's our hierarchy for coding rules? Number one is and always has been your ICD-10 classification system, which is your book and its index. I think that, you know, as coders, if you're a coder, then you know that if you can't index it, you can't code it. But you also have to think about synonymous conditions. Uh, you need to be looking at your index and your tabular both. And you need to be referencing the things as stated in the guidelines. Uh, you know, look to what surrounds the code if, if you do find something in the index to make sure there isn't a more specific code that should be reported. This is especially true in ICD-10, where you have much higher specificity available in the code book, though your providers may not necessarily be documenting more specifically than they ever did before. It will become more important the CMS has talked about, you know, moving to reducing payments for an overabundance of unspecified codes. They want you to be as specific as possible. But we've always been taught as coders that you code to the highest degree documented. Now, your official coding guidelines is your second source, which couples with your indexing. So once you've indexed it, you need to look at all the rules associated with that code. You can't just go by the indexing. You have to look at your tabular. You have to look at your includes and excludes, and not just for the code itself, but the entire chapter and the section. I find that most often when coders make mistakes for inclusions and exclusions, it's related to not looking back to the beginning of the chapter to find things that may always be excluded, or looking back to the beginning of the section and not just the code itself. And then you also have your coding clinic advice toward the bottom of the wrong care. While coding clinic says you can't ignore coding clinic, coding clinic is also meant to support areas of the coding guidelines for which there is no specific instruction. It is not meant to conflict with coding guidelines. And the advice is that if it conflicts with coding guidelines, you default to your coding guidelines. So that is your hierarchy. You should be looking at your indexing, your coding guidelines, and your coding clinic. There's also the AHA coding handbook. Now, many of us throughout the years um, if, if you've been around as long as I have, may remember Faye Brown. 
Um, of course, when she passed, they took her name off of the coding handbook and it just became the AHA coding handbook. But it's always been considered one of those unofficial sources that kind of might have been available to clear up something that wasn't in coding clinic or official coding guidance. A lot of folks use that to train uh, coders when they're new. And while it's more directed to inpatients, it certainly can give you some clarity of, around a few things or things to think about um, in how to set your policies for places where there are gaps in guidance. But again, that's unofficial source. But that is extremely important that for your organization, whomever you work for, that you have all of these policies documented and any references that your folks are allowed to use should be documented. And of course, they should have access to any of those that they're expected to use. I can't tell you how many times in training coders that they've said, well, I don't have access to coding clinic. To me, coding clinic is an extension of your book and your guidelines. And you can't afford not to have an official reference source because that is part of your job. You, you are assigning the codes based on all of these information and all of the accepted sources. So you most certainly should have it. Um, I know it's an expensive tool. And while I'm not you know, trying to promote specifically um, them, I just feel that it's important to have all of your resources. So let's look at that third quarter advice. The question was posed about capturing a patient's mental health conditions on an ER encounter that was for strep throat. And the answer that was provided was that a provider must indicate the condition or any other conditions affected the management of the patient during the encounter for the diagnosis to be reported. Well, this has really always been true. I find a lot of times that there seem to be some remedial questions that get sent to um, AHA for clarification that you could go right to your book and through coding guidelines that have always been there and pretty much have not changed over the years, have the same answer. So let that sink in a minute. So this is probably where folks will start to have some questions. And we had another follow-up question that was sent in stating that they felt the prior advice given in third quarter 2019 that a provider's statement of a patient being treated for Crohn's would be reported even if it did not occur during the encounter and that the new advice that it was state a condition impacts on care are contradictory. So that third quarter advice that the patient um, was on medication for mental health condition and ongoing antipsychotic meds, they thought would seem to constitute affecting management and care of the patient, right? Well, it turns out they're really two different things. So we'll get into that here. They're not exactly the same. So for that 2019 advice, the provider had specifically stated the patient was receiving treatment for their Crohn's and showing the effect on care. While in the 2020 advice, um, they were talking about just medication and a history of a condition that was not shown to demonstrate an impact on care by the provider. It was just in a list. And they further stated that coding professionals should not assign codes solely based on diagnosis noted in the history, problem list, and or medication list and that it is the provider's responsibility to document that the chronic condition affected care and management of the patient for that encounter. So really, all they did was further clarify what's always been true of coding guidelines. I don't feel there's really any conflict here. Now, some folks 
you know, said, oh, we have to scramble and change our policies. Or others said, well, we're not going to change our policies regardless. And it kind of depended on what your approach was in the first place. Were you conservative? Were you not um, in chasing those conditions? But if you look at your coding guidelines in your book, this, this has always been true. You only code what is documented and impacts care for the encounter. If it's just in a list, how do you know it impacts care? The provider hasn't told you anything. So when I talk about you know CMS and their stance, and they use the term support, and under Rad V, they they actually do warn about such things as coding from unreviewed lists or other elements in an EMR uh, that can be carried over from visit to visit without being updated. Quite often those things are contradictory and you do really have to be careful of them. Now, inpatient setting might be a little bit different because you know, we, your discharge and your consults um, can be sent as standalones when under Rad B, and that's basically just due to the size of file limitations uh, within the CDAT tool. And CDAT refers to the central data abstraction tool. That's where you upload your records uh, when you're under Rad B. And there are caveats that apply only to Medicare Rad B that don't exist under HHS and, and Medicaid when they are under review. So you really have to understand your guidance for the type of encounter you're reviewing when it comes to Rad B. But you know, just for everyday coding, your guidelines shouldn't matter uh, is what type of encounter you're you're coding from, because your guidelines don't say oh, only if the patient's on Medicare do you code this way. You know, you should be following your guidelines all the time, no matter what you're reviewing. But if you come under Rad D, there are specifics that do exist based on the type of claim that it is. So you definitely need to know your guidance. If you're under Rad D, you need to know uh, the protocols that exist for the specific type of review that you're under. And you really have to be careful of those EMRs. Those are the most tricky, and we know that most everyone has moved to them at this point. So it definitely can be difficult uh, to ascertain what has truly been documented and supported for the encounter. Uh, a discharge problem list is a little bit different when you're talking about inpatient. Uh, inpatient, you know, those problems were noted as part of their discharge problem list, meaning those conditions were all supported as treated during the stay and should be documented somewhere within that stay. Though it may not be within the discharge itself, you should have documentation of the patient receiving medications for all of those chronic conditions and things that are listed there. There may be procedures that were done. Um, there could have been diagnostic studies, labs, all within that full inpatient record that could support what's in the discharge. And you have to look at it in its entirety, not just the discharge alone. Um, though if you don't have a full inpatient record, what you can do is, is a little more limited. But they do say, you know, for CMS, if you're going to submit something as an inpatient, then you should have the full record. Otherwise, you're going to be really need to treat it as individual standalone in which you would be using outpatient guidelines instead of inpatient. And it would have to be supported within that document itself. So you also have to think about what type of document are you submitting? And RAPS is going away, folks. Um, this could become more problematic for inpatient because those were what were being submitted uh, through RAPS. And the only way you're going to get those diagnoses in now will be to use those fee-for-service claims from the provider. So it better be documented well within that encounter. 
And there's a lot of disparity between that. What's documented in the individual note versus what's been done throughout the whole stay. Now, a nephrologist may not reference anything that the patient's being treated for for his respiratory conditions the same way that the respiratory doctor, your pulmonary, may not reference anything the nephrologist is necessarily doing. So you have different scenarios there. So inpatient could certainly be one of those more tricky ways. But it's really interesting, and I heard someone else talk about this um, fairly recently, that they had done a, a small study about that and looking at the disparity between the way the full patient record was coded and the diagnosis that were documented on the provider's deeper service claims and how much disparity there was. That's really something that um, a CDI program could help with. What are some of the possible pitfalls around the EDPS submission? That this is going to be 100% EDPS submissions when that wraps goes away. So really, you have to start looking at reconciliation of those HCCs, gap closures, if you're only going to be using those fee-for-service claims. Uh, and if the provider said so, do I code it, even if it conflicts with other documentation? Well, for a standard audit, a fee-for-service claim is reviewed under outpatient rules, even if it was an inpatient provider claim, except for consults and discharge, which under Rad B can be submitted using inpatient rules. It otherwise gets treated you know, as a standalone. But it's yet to be tested under Rad V since you know, it hasn't completely gone away yet. So we've yet to really see how this is going to affect HCCs, but it's certainly something that should be on your radar and you need to be prepared for. Other pitfalls? Well, we have the coding guideline that says the assignment of a diagnosis code is based solely on the provider's statement the condition exists. Provider statement that a patient has a particular condition is sufficient. So assignment is not based on clinical criteria used to establish the diagnosis. Well, we know that that's true. They say they have it. Okay, they have it. But that doesn't mean that it's supported within the record. Does it make it reportable? Just because they say they have it. Is there support within that encounter that not just that they have it, but that is impacting care. And this kind of goes back to not just the coding clinic, but your coding guidelines. Now, the coding guidelines for inpatient is anything that impacts the stay, which can be, you know, an extension of nursing if they need additional nursing care, procedures, diagnostics, labs, things I mentioned before, all the things you would think of as support. For a condition. Any of those uh, that impact the member's stay, those are considered reportable conditions. That's secondary uh, diagnosis. So there's a lot of debate around the term support. It's kind of that, oh, you know, ghost in the room that no one really talks about. And you might be on the fence on. It doesn't really matter which side of the fence you are on. But you need to be sure that whoever you're working with or working for, that there are good documentation of policy procedures in place so that everyone is doing it the same way. And if you're a vendor, you most certainly should be giving back the health plan um, Diagnosis that you don't feel are supported and letting them know that they may or may not be supported so that they have a chance to delete those from their submission file. You don't want to make your plan a target for an audit. So you definitely have to look at things that should be deleted 
if it's not supported. So have good policies and procedures in place. Make sure that everyone is trained and understands what those policies and procedures are. And this is where some of your gap closure can come in. If you have these unsupported HCCs and you work for a health plan, you're trying to close that gap. And it's not just about the payments, but it's also tied to you know, the member's care. Are they receiving good care? This, this ties back to other things, not just your HCCs, but other quality programs, like STARS programs, HEDAs, all of these things uh, kind of tie in in some ways. So they definitely have to look at more than just the HCC. So do you have those guidelines and policies to be shared? Have a conversation before you start. Make sure you're on the same page. And make sure that you're, what you're providing back to your folks is exactly what they are asking for. Now that they're you're giving them good information that can be analyzed. I see we have quite a few questions. So looks like we will have time to, to get to some of those here shortly. We have a poll question now. What best describes your role within your organization? Are you a coder or auditor? Do you consider yourself a CDI professional? Do you work at the health plan level? Um, maybe a risk adjustment manager, or maybe you're a coding student or, or someone who works in healthcare but outside of the risk adjustment space. Okay, we still have quite a few people responding, so I'm going to give us another 20 seconds here. Great. Thank you, Tracy. While everyone is answering their poll question, I hope that we've given you a lot to think about. Um, and that will raise some questions. I do see some coming through in the chat. Wow, uh, overwhelming majority of you are coders or auditors in the space. More than 50% of our participants here today consider themselves a coder or auditor. Um, small percentage of you are CDI professionals. And then we also have oh, about a quarter of you who work at the health plan level and about 15% of other. So interesting, well, certainly the dynamic here uh, of folks. So if you're a coding better, let's, let's look at it from this side. You know, be sure that you're sharing your guidelines and your policies with your health plan that you code for. Make sure that you will work with them prior to the launch of any program to make sure that you're all on the same page uh, and that you're interpreting all of the information in the same way. You certainly don't want to have to go back and re-review records that you've already done because you didn't talk through something and agree on something. And if you make changes, you most certainly want to report all those changes to uh, the plans that you work with. If you're an audit entity, then you need to provide clients with a manner of appealing those decisions. Uh, you, you need to leave room for the possibility of discussing things that you can't come to an agreement on. Though you may be under no obligation legally to change the outcome if you've followed guidelines and protocols, you can still work together for an understanding of those outcomes so that you arrive at a decision that while one party may not be happy that if they don't get credit for something, they will understand why they're not getting credit for something. You don't want um, 
an angry client who doesn't understand the guidance that you're using. So you want to make sure at the outset that those things are all outlined and that everyone is on the same page. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the DOJ. We talked about CMS, the fact that you know, they say there's things that's always reportable, but if you look at your guidelines, if you base what's always reportable on guidelines, there still has to be some sort of impact to the care. The Department of Justice, who recently filed a lawsuit, there, you've probably seen it if you're on Facebook or LinkedIn or you know, CNN or whatever news source that you might uh, refer to or any um, groups that you might be a part of, any coding groups you may have seen this. They stated in their lawsuit against the health plan, which was Kaiser, that there is no such thing as a condition that is always good. Now, this definitely can have an impact as we move forward. What that impact might be, we don't know yet. But we certainly will have to uh, be watching what happens with this particular suit. But how do we reconcile the differences in all of this advice? Well, yeah. the answer is very carefully, right? You have to remember to follow all of your guidelines first. That's number one. Your, your book is the source of truth. Your indexing is, is the source of truth. Then you have your guidelines and your coding hook. Now, where there might be some ambiguity or you know, they're not supposed to conflict with each other, um, you do default back to the guidelines if there is a conflict between the two. I've seen a few conflicts, um, it was a year or so ago maybe, that um, AJ put out advice for two different questions within the same coding clinic that contradicted each other. So no one knew what to do <laughs> because it didn't make sense. And then they had to come back and clarify it. But in this case, I just don't believe that uh, clarification or contraindication here that there is any with the advice that they gave, they're basically telling you to follow your coding guidelines. That's what CMS has always said. That is the number one source. So making sure you have good documentation from your providers is really what it's all about, right? And if you have a CDI program, most definitely you want people to be trained well. What does that mean for a CDI program? Well, obviously accurate coding results in proper payments and you wouldn't really be considered you know, a target. Inaccurate coding certainly puts you at high risk for an audit, but not just at a risk for audit, but a risk to the patients and resulting care gaps if you're coding inaccurately. How much focus uh, is your program placing on accurate and complete diagnosis reporting? Are you focusing just on HCCs? Do you consider HEDIS? Do you consider MACRA? Do you consider any of the other quality programs? Or are you strictly focused on one thing? Or maybe you have separate groups of folks who are each focused on a separate portion. But who is taking all that information and bringing it back to put it together, analyzing it, and making sure that you get that gap closure? If you don't have a program, you know, the health plan is likely to lose money over time if you're not closing those gaps. And that is a big part of many health plans initiatives that are going on right now, is getting those, excuse me, hmm, I was about to cough, I don't want to cough and everyone's there. Apologize there. <coughs> that happens because I'm, hmm, you know, it's winter now and it's a little warmer, so throat gets dry after talking for a while. So the HTC gaps is what we're talking about, you know, that's being a big part of plan incentive, or excuse me, initiative. These tie into other programs as well. If you think about it, if you're familiar at all with HEDIS, a lot of what you do with HTCs ties into HEDIS. Um, the things that are done for HEDIS or support HEDIS are our 
are also considered that meet or support for conditions, you know, as, as HCC. So they're kind of intertwined. Under MACRA, which is the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System Program for Physicians, you know, they look at risk to determine comorbidity of patients in an assessment of the provider's efficiency. So you have multiple different things that going on that all tie in together. An example, um, if you look at the diabetes measure for HEDIS and uh, from A1C documentation, that would also support your diabetes HCC reporting. Uh, depending on what that result was, um, you would be capturing the HEDIS category two code, uh, one of the ones I've listed here based on the outcome of that A1C, but under seven, between seven and nine or over nine. And that kind of shows, is that patient or the treatment they're receiving effective? Have they come back down on their A1C? So simply, you know, a single gap closure can affect more than one quality program in many instances. You should definitely not be resting your laurels on just one aspect of reporting. For macro, uh, you know, it's measurement of resources consumed versus the diagnosis assigned across services. So the provider bonus payment for the year is based on efficiency in that prior year. And the 2022 bonus payments are said to have about a plus or minus 7% variance from the overall 14 variance, 14% 14 variance. If you've got a 14, 15% variance in care and gaps, that's really not, uh, not good, really, most certainly. You don't want to be in the under part. You want to be in the over part. It could definitely indicate uh, care gaps. So a physician advisor is one of the greatest assets you can have in a CDI program. They can work with both other providers and your CDI professionals and your coders help identify, excuse me, I'm copy again, when to query a provider. And many of these are also tied to the provider uh, bonus and incentive programs. They become even more important as we move away from wraps and solely the EPPS submission. And I talked a little bit earlier about, you know, when you compared the inpatient claims and individual provider claims um, for fee-for-service, you lose that, losing some of those diagnoses that were reported for the inpatient claim. And so this is going to be a big gap um, very quickly that you really have to take a look at. And if you're not already doing these things, there's still time, but you're certainly behind. But definitely the physician advisor, uh, very important. Someone who is able to speak to their peers at that level with the same clinical knowledge and understanding that can also help your coders and CDI professionals as well. That brings us to our number two poll question. Does your organization have a CDI program? Yes, no, or maybe you're not sure. Okay, everybody seems to be answering pretty quickly. I'm going to give us about 15 more seconds here.
Okay, well, it looks like the overwhelming majority of you, at least more than half, say that you do have a program, while 31% say they do not have such a program, and about a little more than 15% who are not sure if their company has or their association has a program. And that's okay. And if you don't work for an organization where that would be um, a part of your job function is to have that, uh, certainly if you Working on the health plan side, you probably have something going on. If you work for a medical group, you might have one of those programs. Uh, if you work for a hospital, they're very likely to have programs, except in the case of maybe some, some rural uh, hospitals. I know it's much more difficult to staff and find budget room and in smaller locations for such programs. But again, it all ties back to training making sure that everyone is trained uh, appropriately. So most certainly that is very important. So thank you there for the poll. But what does it all mean? Well, you have to bridge those gaps. You have to have something in place to help do that. And maybe if you work for the vendor, you're not a part of the CDI program per se, but you are in the way that the data you are coding and sending back to your plans is what they're using to help them analyze and bridge those gaps. So you may actually be a part of it without even realizing you're a part of it. Have those solid defined guidelines and review your guidelines and compliance at regular intervals. Most certainly, and like I said, having that physician advisor is key. Somebody who can speak to them at a peer-to-peer -peer level it really helps with provider buy-in to any program. And staying up to date with code changes and regulation changes, guidance changes, uh, quoting clinics that come out quarterly, certainly a big part of that. And I also included here the timeline. Um, due to the pandemic, you know, they have extended out the final run until August of next year. So you can see here for the timelines, the dates of service, and when the last time to send them in generally is, um, they collect them and, excuse me, calculate the patient's RAF scores in order to make those per member per month um, payments based on those RAF scores. So just a little information there. I also, uh, put in some of my references here that you can go to and and find uh, specific information. While Coding Clinic is a uh, copyrighted text that I you know can't reproduce word for word, I did give you the name of each of those and what issue they're in. If you want to look them up, if you have that availability, um, there is a link to the original 2008 Technical Assistance Guide there as well. And that will show you um, everything. Uh, it starts on page about 146 for the coding. So let's uh, get to a few of our questions here, because I know we are coming down on time. All right. So thank you, everyone, for submitting those questions. We do have quite a few. OK, so in regards to the CM CMS-8, um, 2008, mm -hmm. it stated chronic conditions listed as always reportable, except in the most minor of encounters. What is mm -hmm. considered minor encounters where they might, where they might or should not be captured? Great question. Well, a minor encounter would be, you know, patient came in and they're just getting their blood pressure checked, or they're just receiving their yearly immunization. Or perhaps they had a cut on their finger and they're, they're being seen for removal of stitches or you know, things like that would be a minor encounter to where chronic conditions would really have no relevance and would not be re considered as you know, reportable in those instances. Okay. Um, ACA does accept audio only, is that correct? That is correct. They do uh, accept audio only on the commercial side uh, and have been doing so under the IVA up to this time. Can't say 
speak to the future or what might happen post pandemic, but right now, yes, they are allowing it. Okay. I work mainly in commercial risk adjustment and was wondering if you will be touching on any other coding rules and or regular regulations for commercial RA besides the brief mention of HHS and ACA. I know many coding rules are similar or the same as MA, but there are also many differences, such as the lifelong permanent condition list, and I do understand these can vary depending on the state of demographics. That is true, and specifically for that reason is why I didn't touch on it um, in any more detail, because it can vary depending on the model and what state we're talking about. They may have a little bit different uh, take on that for the chronic conditions, but yes, the um, lifelong permanent conditions for commercial is kind of the same way you look at the CMS-8, though they are you know, for different entities, uh, most certainly. But yes, those would be the, along the same lines as always reportable. Are RA codes submitted on CCM claims using RA CPT codes acceptable in an RADV? Well, the way that it gets determined is the service provided, which ties back to your CPT code, but it's not the CPT code itself. It's what's attached to your, um, your EMM. So what diagnosis did you link to the service that was provided? you need to be linking your HCCs on the claim to the service that was provided. If you don't link all of your, your HCCs from, from that encounter to that, um, they're gonna get left on the table. Okay. Okay, so this question is about risk adjustment auditors. And this person is wondering if they use any software for their audits. Well, that can vary by company. There's no specific one that I would name or um, recommend, but there are many different softwares out there. Some companies have their own proprietary. So it really just depends on who you work for as to what tool you may have or have access to. That's something that, you know, if you find a good tool or you've used a good tool in the past, bring it to your leadership. See what they think about it. Um, I, I certainly always ask my folks, hey, if you know of something, or you have a reference, bring it to me and let me look at it. I, I may say, yeah, let's go ahead and incorporate this into our policies. Okay. Can HCCs be captured by other clinicians that are not on the eligible list if they are under general supervision of an eligible provider? Um, example, pharmacists during AWV. No, pharmacists are not acceptable in, in any form. They cannot be um, used. There are specific rules, and, it, and this goes back to the, um, it's actually in the Medicare online manual. There's a reference to it there, but no, you cannot use pharmacist information. For, on the commercial side, they use, they have what they call RX, um, and it's looked at a little bit differently. But if you're just doing straight HCC capture, you cannot use that information if you're a coder. Okay. Um, Not enough time to explain the whole behind that one, but yeah. Got you. No problem. I do want to say I'm going to like probably answer like one or two more questions here just because I do want to be mindful of everyone's time. Of course, if you have submitted a question or a comment, I'm going to make sure that Ronnie gets that. Um, as long as you haven't submitted your question anonymously, she, she should be able to like reach out um, to you individually to follow up with you. Um, but thank you all for these many questions. Um, have you seen CMS or ACA RADV results yourself? If so, what surprised you about records passing or failing? Well, I've participated in many RADVs over, over the years, both uh, for commercial and for, um, excuse me, Medicare. Uh, I think what, you know, really what I have to say kind of boils down to the auditor that you get. You know, every auditor may see something a little differently. So from year to year, you 
to get some results that you are perplexed by. I don't know that there's a specific code or reference that I could give, but really uh, what I find interesting about it is CMS pretty much says under Rad B that you really have nothing to dispute unless we've given conflicting advice. Um, there's really no fighting them. <laughs> And, and that's the hardest part, uh, trying to get something allowed after it's been, you know, not approved or, or not uh, accepted. Fighting it is very difficult. Um, pretty much uh, one of the things that I've seen is even the death of a provider uh, did not uh, allow an exception you know, of being able to track down a record or an attestation. So under Medicare rules, it's a much tighter than under ACA rules and IVA. They're, they're far more lax on, on the IVA side. You know, they allow things without signatures for an EMR. If it's an EMR, you don't have to chase the attestations like you do um, under CMS unless it's something, you know, that just isn't standard. So there are a lot of differences between the two. So I, I think I find those most interesting. Okay. And then the last question, um, this person is wondering if you can talk about EDPS, um, specifically like it versus RAPS. Okay, EDPS versus RAPS. RAPS is when you collect the data and send it in in a specific format to CMS that does not come directly from your claims. So it's basically like you going, reviewing your reviewing records and then turning around and submitting that information to CMS, like what many vendors do. You know, they're reviewing for the HDCs, they give you back a file format and that gets submitted to CMS for um, submission. EDPS is a manner of where all of the information is coming via your claims not through a specific review. So that means that your claims better be clean and coding better be correct right at the outset. And that is what most people will be reviewing once that wraps goes away. So you'll be looking at comparing what was coded via the claim versus what is actually in the record so that they can clean up the claims and delete or add any diagnosis that should be. So then you resubmit those to CMS. All right. Well, thank you all um, for, for joining us today. A big thank you to, to Ronnie for, for joining us and being our speaker, as well as a, a big thank you to Centauri for helping us sponsor today's event. Um, thank you all for joining. I am going to be launching the member experience survey here in a second, um, just so we can get your feedback about today's experience. Again, if you do have any questions, feel free to go ahead and pop those in, um, and I'll make sure that Ronnie gets a copy of those. Um, but thank you all for joining us today again, and if we don't see you, I hope you have a, a wonderful holidays. Um, bye, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your week and weekends. Yeah, I hope to see you all in Nashville in the spring. Thank you so much to the Rise Association today. Thank you.